What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to the AFC South Roundtable. I am your host, TD, with Roundtable Sports. And listen, make sure that you hit that like button. Let your friends and family members know that the AFC South Roundtable exists. Man, we have the usual suspects. Let's go ahead and get started with the top of the division, Ruben. Uh. Uh, What's up, man? town till I drown. How you doing, Mr. TD? I'm great. I'm feeling good. You know, a lot of things happening in the NFL. I can't wait to talk about the AFC South tonight because mm. y'all the big dogs. And then on hey. free agency, I heard y'all doing some things. How you feeling about it? Hey, man, I'm feeling great. Every one of our teams is doing some type of moves out there. But as a Houston Texans fan, you just got two big splashes, right? Daniel Hunter and then Joe Mixon. You just gave uh, Joe Mixon a three-year extension a couple of days ago. It is all up here in the H, man. All up here. Nice, man. We're going to get into that and so much more. But before we do, we got to bring in a team that's right there, right behind you, man. They, they feel like they should have been ahead of you. But some unfortunate events happen. UCF Jaguar! Yo, what up, what up, what up? Hey, thanks for having me, man. Ready to be here. I'm just happy the Jags got better during free agency. Really can't wait for the draft. We got all of our draft picks set and ready to go. So if we nail the draft, man, we should be significantly better to make a pretty good run at the 2024 NFL season. Nice. I know, um, you know, the Texans, the Jags, all these teams fighting over certain players. They were even in a fight with a certain player with the coach recently, but the coach missed out. Derek, what's going on, man? I wish I could say I was happier to be here, honestly. Uh, it's not necessarily the podcast. It's just more to do with my, you know, my trash-ass GM. That's what he's doing right now. <laughs> man, I am so pissed off, man. I I am ready to let some sparks fly. I thought he was the best GM in the division. I, I do not, not want to hear your shit. Week. I do not want to hear your shit, UCF, bro. I don't got to hear it right now. I don't want to hear it. Hey, I will say this. You know, when you start talking about your misery, Derek, there was one guy that just seemed very happy. He's backstage right now. Ty Rossi. <laughs> what is going on? The Titans are fighting their way back to some relevancy. I'm super excited about what Rand Carthon is doing. Um, you know, obviously, when we were on here last week, they haven't made that calvin ridley move yet and it was just kind of like i was kind of still into like oh, what are we gonna do what are we doing and that calvin ridley move uh made things just i don't know made things a lot better and a lot more hope uh mm -hmm. for titans fans coming up this season Interesting. There's a lot of hope for all teams coming up this season. But listen, if you're in the chat, thank you so much for tuning in. Make sure you hit that like button on your way in so that more people can know that we are live. If you have a super chat and want to drop it for the fellas um, and have them answer any questions, feel free to. We'll go through those as well. But let's go ahead and get started, ladies and gentlemen. I got to go back to Derek real quick because you seem like the, the most unhappy you know, um, fan in the entire division. Is this a sentiment of all Colts fans? I mean, what's going on in Colts Nation that has you so bummed out right now? Well, I don't know if it's every Colts fan uh, out there right now, but I know it's the major majority of all of us right now. Um, and it, it mainly has to do with the luxurious Sneed situation that's going on. And the problem mainly is, is we don't know what's going on with that right now. Uh, we've been getting conflicting reports from not only uh, people that cover the team, but just like the national media, the local media, everyone is going back and forth. And I don't really know what's going on right now because, I mean, we, we heard from several different people who I trust and have uh, talked with personally about it, have said that, Legereus Sneed, he's right there, very, very close to getting that deal done. Just got to fine tweet some things. And then you got these big name ESPN people coming over here saying, no, it's not happening. There's never been a trade that's gone down with Indianapolis, and it's just not happening. So I just don't know who to believe right now. And I've kind of just am at the point where I just don't, I, I've gotten to the point where I've just, moved on from expecting Legereus need to come here. 
even when we've had people who, again, I trust on this stuff, who said that within the span of a few a few hours could probably have this deal done for the Indianapolis Colts. But again, like we have gone back and forth on this. I'm tired of talking about it. We the Colts Nation has been rearing on the idea of Legarius Snee coming to Indianapolis. And it from a lot of people said it was a done deal. Even people who used to work at ESPN. But now but no deal is still out yet and nobody's saying anything about it. So I'm, I'm pissed off. I'm frustrated. We're letting all these other big name free agents go that, and we're, and the main thing we're, we're doing right now today, instead of re-signing our, uh, our potential all pro safety and Julian Blackman, you're signing a deep, a fourth string defensive tackle, and a freaking third string guard. I'm so pissed off right now. So uh, about the luxurious need thing, um, I'm hearing that you all wanted him, but the Chiefs haven't had talks with you all like it's been rumored. Is that true or what's going on? That's the problem. We don't know because mm. from what I've heard from, again, the people that I've been talking to, they said the deal is done. The trade compensation has been agreed to. Uh, and the Colts have basically given the Chiefs their draft compensation that they asked for, and they're just working out a deal with Legereus Sneed. Now, the problem that we're hearing is Legereus Sneed wants to be the highest paid cornerback in the NFL, and mm. from what we're sounding is, is Ballard is saying, no way in hell am I going to give you the highest contract in the NFL right now, and that's where we presumed it was at. We were wondering if there was some guaranteed money issue. But then we had Stephen Holder, who is a ESPN writer uh, who covers the Colts, and Adam Schefter, who, again, I don't necessarily want to use Schefter's opinion on it because I feel like he is given a lot of false info when it comes to the Indianapolis Colts, given the fact that he's, you know, he ruined the Andrew Luck retirement announcement. Uh, so the Colts probably don't want to give Schefter any kind of news, but they are, they're saying that there's not a deal done for the trade. And they said it's most likely not going to happen. So someone is lying and someone's being given false information. I don't know who to believe, but the only problem mm -hmm. is I'm more inclined to agree with the side that I don't want to agree with because the deal ain't done yet. The, it, that news broke like, almost four days ago that it was going to happen. And now here we are, it broke out Saturday and here we are Tuesday evening, still nothing's done. So I'm just at that point where I'm like, I don't know who to believe. And I've just accepted that it most likely ain't going to happen. Mm. Wow. Tough times down in Indianapolis and breaking news. The latest report is Legereus Sneed spoke with someone and told them that he would love to play for Brian Flores in Minnesota. That's the most recent report just coming out. All right. So, um, man, time will tell, Derek. Um, and 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 last question, Derek, before we move on, because I got to ask Titan Rossi something here. Um, yeah. is Sneed the difference maker anyway? Is is Sneed the difference between you beating the Texans and and beating the Jags and you know dominating Tennessee? Is he the difference maker? He absolutely could be. I mean, he's one of the few corners in the NFL last year that uh, never gave a receiver more than 75 yards in a single game. I mean, he is perfect for the system that Gus Bradley runs because Gus Bradley runs more cover three than any other DC in the National Football League. And uh, and LeJerry Sneed is a fantastic zone corner uh, just has everything about him. I mean, he's been a consistently really good corner throughout his entire career. And I mean, it just makes all the sense in the world to try and get this guy on your team because then it allows you to just open up a lot more things with your cap room. It allows you to move on. But, you know, the problem with it having taken so long to get to this point is I don't know where Ballard's mind is is stuck at right now because you know we still haven't signed a safety and that's going to be a big issue if the Indianapolis Colts miss out on all the good safeties 
in this free agency class, then our secondary is going to be trash this next year, regardless of who, who actually steps up. So Jerry Sneed 100% could have been the difference maker to really uh, change the dynamic of the secondary, but I just, I don't know. I, I don't think it gets done, and Ballard's just letting all these other people go because he he's just bargain bin Ballard. Boy, oh boy, man, Derek, I ho hopefully you get some good news and things flip around for you. Titan Rossi, what's going on in Tennessee right now since we last spoke? Yeah, I mean, Calvin Ridley was the big signing. Um, you know, it brings a lot of hope to Titans fans. You know, that's been the big issue with the Tennessee Titans the last couple years is, you know, we don't have any speed at receiver. And this is the new age of Brian Callahan and him bringing this type of offense in, something that Titans fans have not had in a long time. You know, not saying we even have it yet. You know, it remains to be seen. But, you know, the direction that it's going in is exciting. And, you know, to have a guy like Ridley who has speed, yes, he is a little older. I mean, he missed almost two seasons. He, he had some pretty funny uh, comments at the presser um, talking about how he's really 25 years old and all this and that and how he can still run and all, all that type of stuff. But, you know, we'll see. I mean, it's exciting. We still need, we still have a hole at the left tackle position. Our defense has a lot of holes. There's a lot of fixing to do, but it's encouraging to see Rand Carthon going out there and making some big moves like this um, and, and getting some players like this because it just shows us fans. It's like, hey, you know, he ain't trying to lay down. This is not the Mike Vrabel, John Robinson approach where we're going to just throw something at the wall and see if it sticks with these, you know, past injured players or these second, third chance type of players that, um, you know, just haven't really showed anything at the past at all. Oh, I guess you could call Calvin Ridley, maybe a second, third chance player, but he has showed something recently, you know, mm -hmm. um, in Jacksonville last year. So super excited about that. Um, and we'll see where it goes. Well, I, I want to ask you about the defensive side of the ball, though. You lose Vrabel, mm -hmm. who is a defensive guy. How do you feel going into next season? Do you feel like you've made some moves in free agency that can help in that area? Um, what's your feel of the defense? Is it going to take a step back? Is it going to go forward? I know you just got Sebastian Joseph Day. How do you yeah. feel about the defense moving into next season? Um, I definitely think at this point it's taken a step back um, mm. because, you know, you, you lost some key players in Autry and Shire to the freaking Texans of all people. Even Jeffrey Simmons, <laughs> Jeffrey Simmons even tweeted about Autry. He was like, really? Like Autry to the Texans? You know, any other team basically, um, which I thought was pretty funny. But they brought in Kenneth Murray, who's kind of been – hit and miss like um you know he's not been like a super productive player he's uh, not really lived up to the hype yet um they brought in like sebastian joseph day is a good addition but i mean he's more of a you know borderline depth piece um at this point in his career i would say so i mean yes a quarterback a cornerback like sneed would be amazing um they did offer a third round pick for him and like a four-year uh $80 million extension, but they had turned it down. So the Titans are out on him officially. Um so you know we're we're out on that train. But yeah, I think they're gonna take a step back, man. I think the offense is gonna take a step forward and the defense a step back. Mm, interested. I just can't wait to see what um the quarterback's gonna look like next year with you know what they put around him. I think they're at least doing him the right justice um, and trying to fix the old line still got work to do, but UCF Jaguar what's going on in Jaguar nation Duval, new yeah, uniforms, all that good stuff. What's happening, man? Uh, all is good over here, man. I mean, uh, I know it was a little bit weird because we went live a week ago and you know, the whole Calvin Ridley situation played yeah. out very strange because there were a lot of rumors about like, okay, it's between, the you know the Patriots and the and the Jaguars and I think really really didn't want to play for the Patriots especially when like 
you know, Ridley will be 30 years old when the season starts. And I, I think when you look at kind of the Patriots, they're not really doing a whole lot. So I imagine he probably didn't want to, I guess, be in that situation. And um, oh, sorry. <clears throat> and the money was like pretty close between the two teams. So he wound up, of course, going to the hold on. He wound up going to the to the Titans because you know they were giving him a lot of money. What was it like twenty three million dollars a year compared to? I think the Jaguars were try, trying to give him seventeen, eighteen million, and you know the G, the the agent of Calvin Ridley really started hitting the phones at like four o'clock once like the whole draft compensation thing went away for the Jaguars, and then he was able to really drive up the value for, for Calvin Ridley, and really with Calvin Ridley. Like, I don't have anything negative to say about him. I know I even spoke a couple weeks ago. I put on Twitter that, like, Calvin Ridley's a great receiver, but I think that he's more of a number two wide receiver, and the Jaguars already have a number two wide receiver. I was kind of more so thinking that Jaguars should go more for kind of find a big body guy that's a lot cheaper, and that's kind of what they got from Gabe Davis. Gabe Davis is, like, $13 million a year versus Calvin Ridley's, like, $23 million a year. So you're getting a lot cheaper of a player. Um, and I think the Jaguars just need to find the wide receiver one in the draft. I mean, you look at wide receivers, man. Wide receivers are found all over the freaking draft. I mean, if you look back at the top five, you know, receiving guys in receiving yards this year. I mean, Tyreek Hill was a was a fifth round pick. Amonder St. Brown was a was a fourth round pick. You look at C.D. Lamb was a number seventeen overall pick. The Jaguars had the seventeenth overall pick this year. Puka Nakua was just drafted in the fifth round last year. And and you also have the um I, f I forget who the other guy was, but AJ Brown was a second round pick. So at pick number seventeen, there's no doubt going to be an elite wide receiver there. But you got to pick the right guy. You know, what I mean, we saw a couple years. You know, Jalen Ragel was picked like a couple of picks before Justin Jefferson. So it's a really tricky position to draft, and uh, the Jaguars just had to nail it. So with Calvin Ridley. Really, his fit in the offense just never really felt right. And I don't know if it was a Jaguars fault or I don't know if it was Calvin Ridley's fault or maybe just the marriage wasn't perfect there. So he moved on to the Tennessee Titans. But what the Jaguars did with that money, they went after Eric Armstead, who I was really wanting the whole entire well, ever since he got released. You know, I was a big person where I'm like, okay, all my if we only make two moves this offseason, I need to get another center which the Jaguars got Mitch Moores from the Buffalo Bills, which is a really good move. And I need another defensive lineman. And they went and got one of the best yeah. in the game with Eric Armstead um, to play defensive tackle. And he kind of reminds Jaguar fans a lot about, like, Calais Campbell when he came aboard. Just, you know, a little bit more veteran, just the way they speak about everything, good head on the shoulders. So it just seemed like, you know, that, that for me was an absolutely awesome move. And, you know, I'm kind of glad the whole Ridley situation played out the way it did because, you know, now the Jags have an opportunity to draft a guy, and I think the money was better spent for the Jaguars at least, you know, on a defensive line. I know a lot of people will say $23 million is too much for Calvin Ridley. I mean, I'm not going to say that. I think it was too much for the Jaguars, but every team ha builds mm -hmm. themselves the their own way. You know, every team, you know, Calvin Ridley for the Titans might be worth $23 million a year. For the Jaguars, I straight up don't think he was, and I'm not – I don't think Calvin really paying him twenty to three million dollars a year is going to hold the Titans back in future years. You know what I mean? But um, it's it's interesting. We'll see how it all plays out. But it does sting a little bit that Calvin really does go to a division rival. So are they going to pick up Trevor Lawrence's fifth year option? What? What do you think? Of course they are. So so are they going to give him a deal this off season, or are they going to wait until after next season though? I think they'll wait after next season just because it was a weird year last year for um, just the Jaguars and Trevor Lawrence. I mean, I mean, Trevor Lawrence, like his, he can go back and it's funny because there's this two and a half minute reel that, or this video that goes around like um, Twitter every now and then of just all these players dropping like touchdown passes or really, really good throws by Trevor Lawrence. And, you know, he was having a pretty good season and then, the injuries started piling up and then, you know, he started playing worse because of the injuries and the team around him, you know, started getting more injured. And then it just almost reflected like, Oh, Trevor Lawrence all of a sudden isn't a good quarterback anymore. Look, Trevor Lawrence is a great quarterback. I mean, he, I mean, we've all seen him, you know, how he plays on his best level. I mean, he's played, you know, against the Colts really well. He's played against the Titans really well. He saw, you know, last time CJ Stroud and Trevor Lawrence faced off in Houston it was a really good matchup. So, yeah, I mean they're going to pick up his fifth year option. Um, I imagine the 
extension won't come until like you know next season just because you know i think trevor lawrence also holds himself to a higher standard i think he says you know what like just gonna focus on you know ball and then you know when the time is right we'll focus on a contract extension but you know it'll come of course they got two more years of control over him so trevor lawrence will pick up his they will not pick up mac jones's though i think this is a very critical season for trevor lawrence because for any reason, if he regresses or does not have a great season next year, you'd have to ask yourself about the extension. You know, what does that look like? Do you even do it or, or do you make him play it out? So this is a huge year for Trevor. And I think that do you feel like they've done the right thing of putting what they need around him to set him up for success, to prove that he's the long term guy? I mean, I think they need to do more work at wide receiver. And I'm not, I'm not talking about, you know, trading for like a Brandon Ayuk or anything like that. Although I'd love him. Like if you look at, you know, if you look at the way the Jaguars roster is constructed, you know, all the pass catchers are making money. Christian Kirk, Gabe Davis, Zay Jones, Evan Ingram, you know, all of them are making money. It's time to draft a young receiver. And, you know, Trent Baalke, you know, going into his fourth draft as a Jaguar, you know, he's only drafted two wide receivers. One was a sixth round pick. One was a seventh round pick. So it's, Time to finally go young at that position. You know, I think they need to, you know, bring in a number one because I think the wide receiver group is decent. I mean, uh, I will say, like, when receivers have come here, like, Christian Kirk made a new name for himself when he came to the Jaguars. <clears throat> so did Evan Ingram. And I'm hoping they do the same thing with, you know, Gabe Davis, where, you know, all these guys improve. And even Zay Jones, when he came to the Jaguars, you know, had a career year. So, you know, I think when they actually build roles for these guys instead of, like, you know, and they actually make good investments because, you know, Christian Kirk was like a third round pick, but from a GM that didn't even, that was only there with him for one year. You know, Gabe Davis was only like a fourth round pick and it was in a weird offense where Stefan Diggs was always wanting the ball. And, uh, you know, of course, Josh Allen took a lot of stuff on his own, but um, I think that they need to go young and talented at wide receiver in the first, at least first two days of the draft. Like I said, if it's not a pick number 17, you know, definitely find a guy on day two. And this is a deep wide receiver draft, you know, so there's going to definitely be some options there, but it's going to take some good scouting for sure. But, you know, just try to, you know, trust your scouts and hopefully it happens. Got it. Now let's move forward to the Houston Texans. Mm. A lot of people say they're the winners in free agency. A lot of people say they're about to take off in the division. How are you feeling today and what's been new in H-Town, Ruben? I know the uniforms have, have gotten leaked. Talk to Man. me about all of that. Man, you know, feeling blessed and high favor. Yeah, so we'll start with the uniforms first. A leak came out, I believe it was around yesterday in the morning, of someone wearing Derek Stingley's jersey but clearly did not look like a football player. They did no justice to the uniform. Um, <laughs> H-Town was upset. And they were like, is this really, you know, the best of what we're going to get? Because what we heard is we could potentially get up to four new uniforms. So 30 minutes later, Cal McNair, he goes on the Houston Texans Reddit page and he drops, you know, the jerseys that were leaked and better images on Nico, on Tank. And, you know, he said more to come. But, you know, we we like them. Um, they're kind of growing on me a bit. But if this is one out of four, I feel like these will be you know, like the least sexy, if that makes sense. I don't mind it whatsoever, but I want to see the battle red, and I definitely want to see the H-Town blue, right? Shout out to my guys at Tennessee. However, um, with the uniforms, we're just excited to see what comes out in April. That's when we will get them, but like them so far, like them so far. We had Xavier and Howard on the OG podcast today. It just came out an hour ago, said how he wants to be a Houston Texan. You know, he's from the age he talked about. He didn't really grow up a Houston Texans fan, but this offseason, he is a Houston Texans fan. It's kind of a trend that we've been seeing of these guys wanting to come to the H. And, you know, some news that the Texans have done themselves. They traded out the first round. They traded number 20 through, uh, I'm sorry, 23. And next year's uh, 232 to the Vikings. And we got number 42, number 188, and a second rounder next year. Um, we didn't understand that trade at all. What are the Houston Texans doing? And that's what it kind of feels like we've been at the past couple of days is like a wait and see because it seems like every other night a player is getting rumored to the Houston Texans. Recently, it's been Stephon Diggs. 
It's been T. Higgins, right? You also have Antonio Brown, CT, ESPN, posting about Stephon Diggs nonstop in Houston Texans uniforms. And it kind of feels like Nick Casario definitely has something up his sleeve now, now that he traded back out of the first round. Right now, it's it's all up in Houston, man. We are wanting training camp to get started. We want to see these new look Houston Texans. Um, we gave Joe Mixon a three year extension. He will be a top ten paid running back in the NFL. Uh, we learned that Daniel Hunter had offers from other teams, but he but he decided to take less to come to his hometown. So right now, the Houston Texans are doing everything right in for agency. I definitely think that. They brought in five to six starters and, you know, two home run splashes in Hunter and Mixon. You know, I feel good right now being a Houston Texans fan. Boy, oh boy. Listen, um, I got a question for you about your boy, um, CJ Stroud, man. Okay. Um, Do you feel like he takes another step forward, stays the same, or regresses a little this year? Because it's got off the charts last year, bro. You know, that's a great question. And this is something that me and my, you know, my homeboy were talking about last night is like, what if CJ Stroud does have a sophomore slump, right? Quote unquote. I don't expect him to be always in his NFL career leading the league in yards per game. I would absolutely love that. But, you know, this is a guy who in year one shocked the NFL world. And now they have tape on him. They have a full 17 games plus playoffs. This is why you needed to go out there and get Joe Mixon, go out there and bring back Dawson Schultz and bring in some more weapon, uh, weapons on the offense because if there is that quote-unquote sophomore slump, these playmakers have the ability to take a pass and take it to the house. So um, definitely yeah. felt like the Houston Texans invested into C.J. Stroud. Another thing they did earlier um, a month ago was bring back offensive coordinator Bobby Slowick. They gave him a big pay raise, so he will be here one more year. And quarterback coach Gerard Johnson, who has been with C.J. Stroud all the way since he was in high school in the Elite 11 competition, they brought him back, gave him a hefty pay bonus. He will be our offensive coordinator next year when Slowick leaves to become head coach. The Houston Texans have did everything, invested into C.J. Stroud, and, you know, they've prepared. They've prepared. Uh, is your quarterback the best quarterback in the division? Oh, I mean, yeah, he showed that all the way in week four when he went up to Jacksonville and just smacked the Jaguars. C.J. Stroud is him, ladies and gentlemen. Like, you saw with and, – and I saw someone talking about the offensive line. Our, our O-line didn't start one game together last season. And a zero-sack performance against the Pittsburgh Steelers, a zero-sack performance against the Jacksonville Jaguars. Now you're adding in Joe Mixon, and you have Tank Dell coming back off an of injury. The Houston Texans are reloading. Put the camera back on UCF, man. They walked into that play. <laughs> uh, but, man, he is the best in the division. And I said it last week, man, in the AFC. I think, I think he's a top three quarterback. So, UCF, have you changed your stance that C.J. Stroud is the best quarterback in the division? Because you had a head-to-head -head when we were talking all this stuff in the regular season. And he did take care of business. How do you feel about the quarterback now? Who's better, CJ or Trevor? I mean, last I saw, Trevor went to Houston Texans and then uh, whooped their ass in their home. So I don't know I what we're talking what. about. I mean, they're one and one what. against each other. But uh, if I'm being objective, look, if you were to power rank the quarterbacks, you know, you got to deduct Trevor Lawrence a little bit. Even though he was injured, he still didn't play well in December. Okay, we can handicap it all we want. So, you know, if we're power ranking things, I mean, CJ Stroud right now is number one. And Trevor Lawrence is number two. But, you know, we'll see when we have this conversation again at this time next year how things go. But, you know, it'll be – I'm just looking forward to, like, fun quarterback uh, competitions in this division. Mm. I can't remember last time there were, like, two simultaneously good quarterbacks in this division. You know, so I'm hoping that, look, we start having Monday night football AFC South games instead of the Thursday night December trash throwaway games. So – yeah, I mean, yeah, I have all the confidence in Trevor Lawrence, but I can't sit here. You know, right now, we just got to go out there and, and prove that he's better. And right now, you know, if you're powering things, you know, Trevor Lawrence is not number one, unfortunately. Hmm. 
So, so why, like, are we just going to automatically just disrespect Anthony Richardson? I know he wasn't on the field, oh but God. when he like, was on the field, I'm talking about him. He's a but, ghost at this point. But when he was on the field, wasn't he, was he not balling? I mean, what's your guys' Rossi, thoughts about when he eight, was? Rossi, I've man. had to, Rossi, I've had so many arguments with your, with your fan base over the last few weeks. It, like, it's <laughs> funny because like all the other fan bases, they just shut up about Anthony Richardson. But it seems like your fan base is the only one that gets salty. It's you you, because you, for number you got three. sloppy seconds with <laughs> Will Levis instead of Anthony Richardson, who I know y'all wish you had. Okay, so I mean, at the end of the day, I, I'll remind it once again: in ten quarters of football, Anthony Richardson had almost more touchdowns than wow, Will Levis Lord, did in go. nine games playing football. Again, nice. that's 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 crazy. You, Especially you given the fact that it was Anthony Richardson the first couple games of the season, not back half of the season when he had more time to learn how to read a defense, to have more throws, to be able to do all this stuff. So, again, I, I just want to reemphasize it once again. Everybody can disrespect Anthony Richardson. It's okay. It's fine. When, I don't, when I don't I, when this my whole... guy plays better than, better than Levis next year, plays better than Trevor Lawrence next year and is right on par with Ruben's guy, then we're going to, we're going to have this conversation once again. So he's not going to be better than Strell? time with it. Of course not. So I'm, what do you, he just admitted he's not going to be better than Strell. <laughs> Go ahead. Tell you, Russ. TD, he had three TDs passing, right? He had four rushing touchdowns. Oh, come on. What are <laughs> See, we, I love Fields? that everybody acts Fields? like as if, okay, okay, hold on a second. Okay, hold on, because I had this argument with the guy just a minute ago. So we're saying that Lamar Jackson's touchdowns running just never count? Like, they're just not as important yeah, but he as, can throw the ball. they're not as important as uh, his throwing touchdowns? No, like, but Lamar Jackson's here? played like eight Last years I in recall, NFL. a touchdown is still seven points one way or the other. Last I remember, dude, people were people were debating that when he was a rookie and he was running touchdowns in. But then after eight let years, me he proved that okay, he actually can throw the ball. Let me ask you this, Derek. Though, okay. in all reality, and I know, you know, I know, Ty, I see them going back and forth with you sometimes. Um, I stay out of that mainly. It's I don't really <laughs> care. But do you want Anthony Richardson, you know, running? like he did last season. I mean, do you, uh, yes, he is that he can be that type of quarterback, but do you want him being a Lamar Jackson type of quarterback where he's just given full reign and he can run whenever he wants? I mean, I don't know. I mean, you're talking about more injury possibly. Well, here's the I thing. Mean, so with that, I don't want him to be having the free reign to run whenever he wants. I think last year, we did the Shane Steichen did a great job of calling designed runs, which resulted in Anthony Richardson having a lot of success and oftentimes walking into the NFL or into the end zone unscathed. I mean, literally, that was right. the things we were dealing with. The one, the two times he got hurt, he let up on a run, and that was not his play style. That was not Shane Steichen's fault. That's Anthony Richardson thinking that this is still the it's still college football and I can just walk past anybody that I so choose to and I got leveled at the goal line when I shouldn't have had to and that resulted in a in a unfortunate concussion. A whiplash with the back of the helmet. It happens to about a hundred different guys in the NFL every single year. And then so that that injury that he had from your guy, he was trying to throw it. Tried to run away last second. You have 290 pounds of human landing on that shoulder. And let's face it. I mean, there's more body mass when it comes to Anthony Richardson versus someone like a Lamar Jackson. So that extra, that extra beating at the, on the ground, that counts for a lot more. It's a lot more body mass. So that, that happens from time to time. So let, let me ask this, and this is for all four of you, mm. because I want to make sure that we're evaluating Anthony Richardson properly, right? Let's live in a world where he never got hurt. He isn't injury prone. That is no concern. As a player, okay, who is Anthony Richardson to you, Ruben? Like as far as who do I compare him to? 
Like, or, like, is he any good? Do you well, like I mean, his yeah, game? Yeah, because I wanted him. Like, I was thinking if the Houston Texans pick Anthony Richardson, right? Like, I would be excited. However, we all knew that he was going to be a project, right? I think this was really his first real um time at uh, Florida being the starting quarterback. And, you know, had a lot of games where, you know, just wasn't really good throwing it in the air. So we knew that he was going to be an exciting player on the ground using his feet. He should be able to truck over, like, anybody in the secondary. Um, it was going to take some time with AR-15. So, but after the the injuries, and like Derek mentioned, he did this in the first couple of games, not the back half of the season. If he did do it in the back half of the season, you know, I think we would all have a little bit of concern about AR-15, but teams get better. And you saw what we all did in free agency. The Colts did nothing. They will continue to do nothing. And how can you feel confident about AR-15 going forward when they did nothing to invest mm. and put weapons around them? So, I mean, the judgment is still out. However, right now, I don't think the Colts are setting them up good. Mm. What about you, UCF Jaguar? Who is Anthony Richardson? Let's discount the injuries. I mean, how do me, you view him? To me, it's a complete, it's it's an incomplete grade right now because I mean, look, I'm someone I I live in Florida. I've watched pretty much most of his games when he was at the University of Florida. And one thing I saw was an extremely athletic guy who got hurt very easy and could have gains where he was just incredible, but you have gains where he just completely didn't show up and he was completely inaccurate. And it looked like this guy can't hit any pass. And so far in the NFL, you know, we've seen all the ups and downs of him, but, you know, I think he's only played like one complete game. So, I mean, how do you, I, I like his ceiling, but, you know, his floor is also a little bit scary. So, I, I, I don't know. I mean, for me, it's an incomplete. I mean, I like the body of work. I understand why you draft a guy like that because, you know, he can do it all. And, and, and man, if he could hit his ceiling and be consistent with it and, you know, and, and, you know, play good football, you know, most of his games. I mean, you know, he's by far the scariest quarterback in the division. But, you know, I, I really do worry about the injuries because that's not something mm. that just – because he got hurt a few times for the Colts last year. And back in the University of Florida, he was getting hurt a lot. So I, I worry about that. I, I do worry about the injuries with him. Titan Rossi, what about you? Who is Anthony Richardson disregarding the injuries? Um, And yeah. is he better than Will Levis? I mean, at this point, it, it's it. Who knows? Like I said, like uh, like UCF said, he's it's incomplete at this point. I mean, if you look at Anthony Richardson and Will Levis, both their college careers were inconsistent. There were times where Will Levis looked amazing in college. There were times where he didn't. The same with Anthony Richardson. I mean, you look at him back at Florida. He had some awful games. He had some games where he couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. I saw it in college. The same with Will Levis too. Um, I'm not. I'm not one to sit here and dog on Anthony Richardson or anything like that. I think Anthony Richardson has a hell of a ceiling. I do. I think he's uh can be a great quarterback in the NFL. Now, you know, we picked up a guy last year um, or a couple years ago, Malik Willis. Now, Malik Willis was not near what Anthony Richardson is. I don't think. A lot of people back then were saying Malik Willis could go in the first round and all this and that. Um, and clearly he couldn't. He just doesn't have what it takes at the NFL level to be a starting quarterback, in my opinion. Now, he might change. Who knows? I think Anthony Richardson has that extra ability that Malik Willis didn't. For one thing, he played SEC football. You know what I mean? Um, if Anthony Richardson, Richardson can stay healthy, Yes. I mean, watch out. I mean, he could be a really amazing quarterback if the Colts use him the right way. But to sit here and say, like, I see Derek, like, shaking his head, like, oh, Will Levis is going to be, like, he thinks Will Levis is going to be terrible and all this stuff. But I just don't see how you could say that with Will Levis. I mean, if you go back and watch Will Levis watch games, and some of the how. games that he played this season, yeah, watch some of the games he played, dude. Like, he made some incredible plays. I mean, that's one good game. 
He had one good game in the nine yeah, games. If you're looking at one if, good game, if, one, if you're looking at a trash at ass Falcons stats. team that I know beat the Indianapolis Colts, Dude. but he played one good game. Did he not beat the Dolphins you, too? It, it, it had, hey, UCF, you obviously man, you didn't see the Dolphins game. You didn't see the Steelers game. There were moments in those games where he pulled up at the second half and at the end and played he like a freaking superstar, dude. I mean, he was getting smashed and and throwing dimes out there. He's a rookie quarterback, like, and mm. Anthony Richardson's literally played barely any games. So I he think had one he really touchdown can't... in all the remainder of his games this year. Besides the one that was the one that, but look at the before. offensive he had line he had every compared game. to the Colts. You want to call that great quarterback play? We would be. Dude. I'd be sitting here saying Anthony Richardson's the worst draft pick ever if I saw Anthony Richardson only getting one touchdown a game, regardless of what the situation. Did was I say it. great? Look at the Colts offensive line compared to the Titans. That's Look the at the same Colts argument roster. I got told. Andrew Luck to never had roster. an offensive line. He was a generational oh, come on. Andrew, player. Andrew Luck is a generational quarterback. Come on. Are you, are you comparing Andrew Luck to Anthony Richardson? Is like for a real? Huge gap? Yes, there is. There's a huge okay. Gap. Well, I mean, the is, Anthony, is at the end of the day, on. you can label that based off of he, it, Anthony Richardson. At least Anthony Richardson in that Houston game, I feel so bad in that second game against the in the first game against the Houston Texans. Oh my God, Ruben! If we if Anthony Richardson would have stayed healthy in that game, he would have had a performance that no Titans fan could ever say Will Levis could ever touch. He had two touchdowns oh, in the God. first five minutes of that game, and it would have just continued to climb. <laughs> hey, I'll say this, man. Derek go hard for AR, man. I will say that. Man, you Derek, gotta Derek give him that. that. You know, gotta give him that. Good points. Well, well I let appreciate, me I appreciate let, everybody's honesty though on it. And hey, listen, at the end of the day, we all we all got some good quarterbacks. We all got some good quarterbacks that are gonna be fun to watch. Then let's play this game. Anthony Richardson, scale of one to ten. 10 being Brady, Mahomes, okay? All right, scale of 1 to 10. So, Titan Rossi, great Anthony Richardson. Man, at the at this point right now where he's at in his career, I mean, I would say, I mean, I, for his body of work, I would have to say a, a 6. Just because it's incomplete, mm. there's too mm. You can't really judge it at this point. I think you got to give it at least if he played half a season and he played that way, I'd say if he played the way he did, I would say like an 8. But right now I have to say a 6 just because it's incomplete, you it's know. It's still strong. It's strong. Um Derek, what would you give your guy? Well, I mean, are we just basing it off of uh, what we also saw eight quarters. One, or are we just basing it yep, based yep, off of eight quarters? That's all you got. That's all you got. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'll go with um, I'll go with Rossi at the six. I'm not going to go any higher. There was a lot of there was a lot of good moments when it came to Anthony Richardson. He did bring us back all the way from being down by 20 against the Rams to put it into overtime. Uh, had some great moments before his injuries, but. Uh, like we said, it, it's only been a minimum amount of work. I yeah. have a feeling he can become one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL, but he's got to get there first before he can act. Before I can actually say that, so I'll go stay with a six. UCF. I mean, if you were to if you were to grade Anthony Richardson in college, it's probably like a five. But you draft him at number four overall because of the potential that he has to be. And so far in the NFL, like. You had to grade. I mean, for if you grade him for what it is, it's probably a five. But of course, it's all about what can he become, and that's the big yeah. question mark. And that's why, honestly, it sucks that he went down with injury. I would have loved to have been able to stack him against all the other quarterbacks and really see what's going on. And then maybe Derek can stop crying every week when we talk about him getting injured all the time, and he can tell us, "But he got nine touchdowns in <laughs> seven seconds one day, one game." And I'm like, you know what I mean? But you know, we got it. We got it. We got to live with it. So I, I don't know. It's uh. Right now, uh, right now, based on body of work, five. Ruben? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to give it a five, a step below Gardner Minshew. You know, we just don't know what <laughs> AR. 
That'll never, that'll <laughs> never go away. I, 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 as, you did there. as long as Let's this channel did remains there. a thing, that will never not be a thing. I mean, we just don't know what y'all let him team, man, at all. And, you know, based off of those eight quarters, I mean, he did look good, right? Was putting, you know, was putting up a good game against my Texans. So I'll give him the five. I'll give him the all five, right. you know, but only after eight quarters, man, what can you really say? All right, Titan Rossi, grade um, Levis. I would give Levis a six, too. I mean, mm. just because, look, I mean, you got to look at what the Titans were this season. I mean, they had a terrible roster. They really did. I mean, their their offensive line was absolutely putrid. It was literally at least 30th in the league, if not last. I mean, I would say they were at least 30th. I mean, they were terrible. The guy didn't have barely any time at all. I mean, he'd snap the ball and boom, he's getting smashed. You know, like um, it was just absolutely terrible. And they didn't have any weapons. They had one weapon, DeAndre Hopkins. That was it. I mean, you had Henry to run the football, but he's not really a, a, a threat in the passing game. You had Tajay Spears, but that was really about it. Chig couldn't catch the ball last season. They had Chris Moore and NWIs, their, their, their other wide receivers. I mean, it, it, it was a putrid offense, mm. and I'm really excited to see what he can do this year with some weapons. But I would say, I don't know, I would give him a five to six. I mean, okay. I, and I'm just being realistic um at what he's at, at what he did because i watched every single game every single minute of his play and i did see improvement Derek, <sighs> for levis i'll go i'll i'll end up going with a five um just because again like rossi said he's got a good point the offense was not really catered to him very well and not to mention the i think that the staff was not put in place very well to manage Will Levis. Um, there was a lot of moments where Will Levis just looked lost on the football field, but there were a couple times where, you know, he did just enough to be able to keep his team in games. Um, it's kind of stunk that outside of, I would argue that outside of the, uh, outside of the first game against the Falcons, his best game was against the Indianapolis Colts when we went into Nashville. Uh, he was tearing up our defense there for a while, and I was getting so pissed. But at the end of the day, yeah, he's got a lot to work on. But I, I do think if they are able to finally get an offensive line around him, which, I mean, by all intents and purposes, they got their center of the future – uh, they got a good left guard, uh, and if they get Joe Alt at their left tackle position, their offensive line is immediately going to uh, boost by a lot. And I think that now that he's got two good weapons in Hopkins and Ridley, and they might even go and get more in the second round as well, uh, wouldn't surprise me at all if Levis has a much better jump this next year. But I'll go five for right now. Well, I'm going to ask UCF and, and Ruben the same thing, and then we're going to keep going around the table. But I got to pause for a second. I, I just want to make sure. Are these excuses, though? Because, you know, I kind of feel like when you look at the Texans and you got D-Hop, I mean, I mean, when you look at the Titans with D-Hop and Derrick Henry, isn't that more than everybody thought the Texans had to begin the season? Yes, yes, that is true. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Nico Collins in his first three years, no one thought he was going to have 1,300 yards. Um, Tank Dell was a rookie. No one thought what we were going to get from him. And then C.J. Stroud, no one expected him to be one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. I would say, like, you know, with Tennessee, and then if you're asking me, I mean, I'll give him a five. That offensive line really was that bad. And oh, yeah, Andre Dillard – who That's should true. no longer play a snap in the NFL. I cannot believe I wanted him at left tackle when he was coming out. Thank God we went with Titus Howard. But I saw Will Levis run from his life. And, you know, first game against Atlanta, I mean, four touchdowns, just throwing it up there, showing off the arm. I love the way he plays. He plays angry. He plays with fire. He's not afraid to show his emotion on the field. However, there were some times where it just did not look good. Like what Derek said, look lost, you know, at sometimes not knowing what to do. Got got scared in the back foot a couple of times. I'll give him a five. Mm, the UCF. 
I mean, I'll give him a six. I actually do like Levis, and I thought he put together some good work. I think the big thing about him, though, is like when he he didn't. It wasn't like you know C.J. Stroud or Anthony Richardson where he started Week One. You know, he didn't start until later when the wheels were falling off and the coach was half in, half out. Yeah. You know, the team was kind of in a weird spot when it comes to like, all right, they were in a, in a situation where it's like, all right, screw it, we'll just play the rookie and see how he does. It was it wasn't a situation where it was like, okay. We're going to put Will Levis in there. We're going to make a comeback to start a playoff push. You know, he got brought in there. It, it just, you know, the team was kind of dead in the water. So I think he put together – I think he did as good as you'd want, you know, from a rookie quarterback, you know, given the circumstances. He showed some, you know, good things. He showed some bad things. And I think, you know, even Trevor Lawrence is a good example. You know, like his – Trevor Lawrence's rookie season had Urban Meyer as a head coach, probably the worst head coach in NFL history. They had like, you know, LaVisca Chenault out there running routes. It was just a terrible, terrible spot for the team. And he went three and 14 as rookie year. You know, one year later when they actually bring in some good coaches, got him some help, you know, he went, he won the AFC South and even won a playoff game. So it, it, it's a lot about the supporting cast. And, you know, I, I'm not sure if, you know, he necessarily had that. And I'm not even sure if, you know, the offense was really catered to, you know, for a Will Levis to really succeed. So, um, you know, I think with that one, I'll, I'll, I'll greet him at a six right now. Um, and, you know, it's really up in the air. I don't, I don't know if he's the answer. Or I don't know if he's not. But, I mean, I think you're, you know, all Titans fans are definitely on board with saying, you know what, we don't need to draft the quarterback this year. Will Levis showed enough to make sure that we can kind of roll with him in 2024. All right, let's move forward to Trevor Lawrence. Give me your grade, Titan Rossi. Um, you know, I, I would give Trevor Lawrence a seven and, you know, I mean, he was injured. The injuries really played a huge part in, in him this season. Um, I would give him a seven just based on those factors. I still well, think caveat, Trevor, not to interrupt you caveat yeah. as a player in general, not just last season, their body of work. Oh, gotcha. Okay. His body of work. Um, I would give him a seven still. I mean, considering all the all the stuff that he's been through, like like he said, with Urban Meyer and all that stuff, I think based on talent alone, I would give him a seven. I mean, let's mm. uh, let's say a six point five, you know, just to be just to be fair. Six point five to seven. I think that, you know, he's still got so much talent, man. Like he does have that. I wouldn't, I, I'm not going to go as far and say generational talent, but he does have that talent, man. Like if he can put it on and um, play the way that, that he could really play, I mean, he could be a heck of a quarterback in this league and he's shown mm. moments where he has been a heck of a quarterback. I've seen him do it against the Titans where you're like, good Lord, man, can we just stop this guy? Um, so I don't know, man, I'm going to stick with a solid seven just for him so far or a lot of that for me is based on his his talent well i'm gonna skip straight to ucf jaguar because do you feel like that's disrespectful uh, he made it sound un- non-disrespectful but seven six point <laughs> five seven is it is that disrespect to trevor well look honestly people can kind of say whatever they want to say about trevor and it's fair i mean they i mean like I, I do know that if you actually talk to people that do sit there and grind on the film and actually watch what Trevor Lawrence has done, I mean, they all know like how good he is and kind of different situations he, the situations that he was put in. And I mean, I've seen him even like before the injury, for example, he was like 12 and four in his previous previous 16 regular season games. And then his, his injury happened in the same game. Christian Kirk's injury happened. And then just everything started piling up where, it just the straw broke the camel's back. I mean, like pretty much all of your offensive linemen were hobbled with injury. You know, every wide receiver except for Calvin Ridley was. And honestly, when you look back on it, the Jaguars didn't get hit with the injury bug in a sense of like players out for the season, but everybody was really, really dinked up. And I just know that look at like Trevor Lawrence, like if you actually like sit there and watch the film and kind of watch what he does, you feel pretty good about what he wants to do and also like when people sit here and kind of throw shade at trevor lawrence i really don't mind it because i know next year he's going to go out there and have a really good year and kind of prove to everybody because everybody kind of hopes for his downfall you see a lot because Mm -hmm. you know a lot of times these number one picks these you know these guys that get really really highly rated a lot of people kind of prey on their downfall so 
you know, people can say what they want to say about Trevor Lawrence. I really don't care because I know what he is. And I have a really good feeling that he's going to prove a lot of these pe the negative people wrong. So what's your ranking? I would give him an eight because I have mm -hmm. seen him like, you know, li like I said earlier, I mean, the, the rookie season to be able to battle through what he went through and, you know, Urban Meyer would do something really stupid. And then he'd have to be up there in front of everybody as a 20 year old kid and answer questions for his man child of head coach. Then we saw him get some weapons in there. Then, you know, lead a comeback. I mean, he came back from 27 nothing in a playoff game. Most quarterbacks would be so rattled at that point. He rallied the troops and came back and won that game. And last year had the Jaguars at eight and three, you know, went to Houston in a big playoff type of environment with so many things at stake and went out there and did his thing. He played a really, really good game and made some really clutch throws. And um, it was just awesome to see. It's just really unfortunate with the injury that happened that it kind of derailed everything. And look, I'm not one. I, You know, if you're out there playing, you know, it is what it is. Look, he's going to get knocked down a little bit because of how he played while he was injured. But, um, you know, I have a good feeling next year when, you know, we, we run things back and, you know, we've already got better through free agency. Um, I have a good feeling that, you know, 2024 is going to be a really good year for him. Wow. Interesting at eight. All right. Um, Jag fan 85 said as father of UCF Jag far and a Gator alum, I must say this in 50 years of watching Gator football, AR 15 was the, to me, uh, most frustrating Gator QB ever. This your pops UCF. That is my dad. That's what's up, man. Um, Derek, let's go with, um, Trevor Lawrence, give me your grade. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a really weird score out there, so don't nobody uh, <laughs> go crazy on me. I right? just I'm being different. Uh, seven point two five because I, I don't want to I don't want to quite give him a seven and a half. Uh, but I do think mm. that there's a lot of times where Trevor Lawrence has been a very good quarterback of consistency. Uh, has a lot more good games than he does bad games. Uh, and then I think that warrants being labeled as a solid quarterback in this league. Um, and, you know, I, I want to, I don't even really want to use the last five games of the season last year against Trevor Lawrence. Cause he was dealing with a different injury every week. And you know, the coaches were like, we got to hold this division down. We might as well try it. Uh, and he just didn't end up playing great football because of that. Um, again, the numbers are never, never truly, uh, mind blowing. Like some of the great elite quarterbacks of the league, but he's definitely a guy that is a model of consistency right now in this division. And regardless of what they got going on right now, if they keep the offensive line going well, uh, and they have ETN and they have at least one guy out there for him to throw to, he's going to remain consistent. So I, I'll stick with that score. Mm, 7.25. Ruben, Trevor Lawrence. I'm going to go seven and a half, and you could have convinced me on an eight. You know, I think we all need to remember what the Jaguars were before Trevor Lawrence, and that was an easy W. Bring me Blake Bortles any day of the week, and I know, you know, we are going to win. It's not that case anymore with Jacksonville. I saw Trevor Lawrence come in when the Houston Texans were hot and at home, and they still won from us. And when you look at Trevor Lawrence, it does not surprise you when he has a good game. And like when he has a bad game, we talk shit, you know, we do the memes. This is the generational quarterback that they took number one overall. And like Derek said, he has a he has more good games than bad games, has been in the postseason, a big comeback. And, you know, I'm always going to root for guys who play hurt. And let's be honest. I mean, if Trevor Lawrence is healthy the last five, six games of the season, are the Houston Texans AFC champs or are we even in the playoffs? You know, like you have to have those conversations, but I give him a seven and a half. You can convince me on the eight. Mm. All right. Well, last but not least, let's go CJ Stroud, Titan Rossi. Give me your grade. Um, yeah. And to touch on Lawrence again, real quick, you know, I, I guess, I would have to say after, you know, looking at his stats again and everything, I would have to give him a seven and a half, man. Like, you know, he has 
played, considering the injuries, him playing through the injuries, something I liked about him. So I would have to go. I think at a seven and a half is a is a fair grade for him. Um, for sure. Stroud. So I'm going back to that. Anyway, C.J. Stroud. I'm going to say I got to give him a nine, man. I mean, um, he was uh, he was incredible this season. I mean, you got to for what he did. Um, this season, I know we're not just going off this season, but he's only played a season. So, um, for what he did, um, I don't think the Texans roster was as bad as, as a lot of people said going into the season. Um, but they weren't supposed to be what they were. So I'm going to give him a nine so far, man. I mean, he, he did, he played incredible in some big games, um, I think for me, that's all I could give him at this point until he proves me otherwise. And I don't think it's a, I don't think it's just a, a one year wonder type of thing for him. I think he's going to be a really good quarterback for years to come. And I think that's why Houston is doing all they can right now to, to throw everything on this team and, and go for it. And I don't blame them for it. Mm, big, tough score. Um, Derek. This is this is tough. I'm bouncing back and forth here with um bouncing back and forth with a couple different scores here in mind. Um I will probably go with an eight and a half here. I think it's almost as good as you possibly could have gotten for a rookie quarterback. And you know, a ton of people that you know, a lot of people outside of you know, I don't know how Ruben felt about CJ Stroud before they actually made the draft pick. Um, I could sit here and say to myself that I was probably the highest on CJ Stroud of everyone else here on this panel. Uh, I I knew there was something about this kid. He has that dog in him. And there was, I think the reason I give him an eight and a half is because several different times he went in there and, you know, he had that clutch factor. You know, a lot of people, a lot of other quarterbacks get greater stats throughout the season than what C.J. Stroud had. But and, you know, I kind of talk about Dak Prescott a little bit in that way. But, you know, there's there's quarterbacks that have it. And we know we already know that C.J. Stroud has it just based off of what we saw, you know, that five touchdown performance against Tampa Bay you know, to be able to do what he did against Cleveland in the playoffs, to have a really, really good game against the uh, Colts to be able to make it to the playoffs and just a bunch of other uh, games throughout the season that he really had to do a lot to really emphasize the ability for the Texans to get there. And, you know, it wasn't pretty for him for a lot of different ways. You know, he had just as bad of an offensive line, if not worse, to start the season than, uh, than the Tennessee Titans had uh, to start out. Now, obviously, by the time Levis ended up getting on the field, the tight, the Texans really started figuring out their offensive line. A lot of guys started coming back healthy and whatnot, but he also elevates guys around him. Like Ruben said earlier in this episode, Nico Collins was nothing before this year. I mean, and now Nico Collins is now considered the number one guy in, in uh, Houston right now. And he's going to be for the long term, at least as we think of now, you know, Tank Dell, who was a fourth round wide receiver out there, was having a hell of a season before he went down. You know, great quarterbacks elevate the talent around them. And CJ Stroud certainly did that this year, even despite having a uh, first year head coach as well, like what the Colts did. But he had uh, first year head coach and a guy that's more of a defensive guy rather than an offensive guy. So, I mean, to be able to go into that situation and do that. Yeah. I'll give it an eight and a half. It was a really, really great year for CJ Stroud. Mm. Man, UCF Jaguar. Yeah. I mean, I'll give him a nine and a half and mainly because look like, I don't know what more you could have really asked for him for his rookie season. I do dock him half a point just because of the no touchdown performance against the Ravens and the, in the playoffs. And I think that's fair, but you know, like I said, I mean, you really can't ask any, I mean, what more could you really ask for him out of his rookie season? Um, he did as much as he really could do when he helped, you know, really elevate that team to kind of new heights and, you know, kind of helped the Texans realize, um, some of the talent that they have is maybe better than you know they thought they were. So 
yeah, you had a really good season and I'm um, looking forward to, you know, Trevor Lawrence and CJ Stroud and one on one against each other. I'm hoping we can move one of these games away from the one o'clock window into a prime time mm. slot. I think it'll be a lot of fun. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give him that rating. 9.5. Ruben, talk mm. to us. Man, I'm going to give him a nine, you know, and to answer Derek's question, at the beginning of the draft, I was definitely a Bryce Young guy. And once we lost the number one overall <laughs> pick, well, we said, okay, C.J. Stroud is going to be our quarterback. Um, and, man, what he did was just surprising. I mean, I had to look at myself a couple of times and say, like, is this guy really my quarterback for the next 10 to 15 years? He's not playing like a rookie, playing like one of the best in the NFL and the offensive line did not start one game together all year. Titus Howard out for the season. Juice Scruggs didn't start till week eight. Kenyon Green, um, the final uh, preseason game got hurt. They shut him down. Laramie Tunsil had a knee that kept them out the first four weeks. Yet the Houston Texans offense were able to put up 30 points against the Jacksonville Jaguars, 30 points against the Pittsburgh Steelers. We realized we had something special Nico Collins never had this type of season. I mean, nothing above, I believe, 500 in his first two years and seven yards short, short of 1,300. Tank Dell, one of the biggest steals in the draft, um, a third-round wide receiver, and the story about him telling CJ, tell him to come get me, you know, you love that. This whole offense was a surprise. You also had a first-time offensive coordinator and Bobby Slowick, and to see this type of production, and without a running game as well, the Texans only had three 100 yard rushing performances they weren't from Damian Pierce who we thought was going to be the leading bell cow it was from Devin Singletary and all those three 100 yard performances were victories so the Texans had a top 10 I'm sorry top 15 offense with a horrible rushing attack and you have to give credit to number seven it's CJ Stroud you talk about elevating talent Noah Brown who spent this first couple of years with the Cowboys he broke a record the um, the other two wide receivers that have back-to-back 150-yard performances alongside Noah Brown, Andre Johnson, and DeAndre Hopkins. So to see Noah Brown in that conversation, you know, it's CJ. It's CJ, man. And we knew he was special when we saw him on draft night, and uh, we went to the uh, party at Midterlight Outdoor Theater. He was able to talk to the crowd, and, you know, he said we're going to be special. And in his press game, uh, I'm sorry, his pregame against the Indianapolis Colts, right, got everyone hyped up. We're too special. We're too fucking special. And that's CJ, man. He is special. Like, he has an aura around him. And I spent the last couple of years not having a quarterback. I thought I had one in Deshaun Watson, and that whole thing blew up. CJ Stroud right now is, like, our Lord and Savior right now, right? But – you got to give him a nine, dude, for what he did, for what he is going to do. And the Texans built around him, man. A lot of people should be scared from uh, about CJ. Man, oh, man. I think um, putting the rating on it kind of gives some clarity of how you guys feel about these quarterbacks, man. Um, this is definitely going to be a season to remember for the AFC South because um, I think every team has something to look forward to. You know, the Texans picking up where they left off. Can they – exceed that can the jags get back to dominance in the division by staying healthy adding some weapons um and you know anthony richardson if he stays he healthy what kind of quarterback is he is he the carrier or being carried and titan rossi with the um tennessee titans will levis and company hey he has a team around him what can he do you know, he's not going to have much help from the defense, maybe, but the offense should be there for him. So next year will be really exciting. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for tuning in to the AFC South Roundtable. Again, go check out these guys in their individual channels, all right? All of these guys have their individual channels. The links will be in the description of the video. Ruben. UCF mm. Jaguar, Derek Larger, and Titan Rossi signing out. Thank you all. We love you all. Peace. We are out. It's AFC mm. South Roundtable. <laughs>